Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the last in our series of virtual workshops. And today's workshop is called Finding Peace, Music as a Wayfinder for Grief and Loss. And it's presented by Chris Dingman and Michelle Gorley. Um, this series has been brought to you by the IBMA's Leadership Bluegrass Alumni Committee. My name is Lee Stivers. I'm the co-chair of that committee along with Michelle Gorley. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we start the program. This is um, this program is being recorded, and uh, it will be posted shortly to IBMA's YouTube channel, which is where the recordings of the previous workshops for this year um, have been posted. So they'll be if if you have friends or coworkers or whoever who might like to to see this later, um, we'll be sharing that the link a um, couple days probably. Uh, your mics should all be muted and should stay muted throughout the um, throughout the program. But we do encourage you to type questions and comments into the chat, and we will have some time for question and answer um, period uh, at the close to the end of the the program of the workshop. Um, I want to just make a few introductory remarks for our speakers before I turn it over to them. Um, our, we're very fortunate to have. Chris Dingman here with us today. Chris is a vibraphonist and a composer who is quite acclaimed in the jazz world. He's worked with legendary artists like Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter. He's recorded six albums, performed around the world. He's been profiled by the New York Times, National Public Radio, and AM New York. Six years ago, he had the experience of improvising music as an act of care during his father's final months of life. And the experience transformed him and his music and has opened new pathways in his career and life. And he's here to talk to us about that today. Um, our other speaker and facilitator and the person who put this together for us is Michelle Gorley, um, as well as serving as the co-chair of IBMA's Leadership Bluegrass Alumni Committee. Michelle is a musician, a writer, a chaplain, and an assistant professor of medical education in New York City. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. All right, well, thank you, Lee, for that introduction. And I just wanna thank each of you for being here. I know this is um, not always an easy topic. It may bring up different feelings and memories for you, um, but also wanna to acknowledge too the losses this group has experienced over the past four years. We've lost several members of our bluegrass community who've been really pivotal, pivotal in creating and preserving this beautiful form of music, which we love. I know a lot of us have also had personal losses. And there's also just been a lot of change in the past four years. We may have had changes in our careers, changes in where we live, changes in relationship. And with every change we have, no matter how good it is, there's always something that we lose because we leave something behind. And so just wanted to acknowledge that and to thank you guys for showing up today. Also just wanted to let you know that this is the next 90 minutes. It's a safe space. It's a place where you have permission to feel all your feelings, uh, just like all the notes in a scale, uh, all our feelings are valid and useful at some point. It's a place to be vulnerable. Um, it's a place where all questions are welcome. And it's also a place um, for you to take care of yourself as needed. We realize that things may come up uh, during the session for you and uh, just want to honor and acknowledge whatever you need to do to take care of yourself and feel supported during this time is totally valid and reasonable in that way. And probably to answer the quest elephant in the room um, is how did we get a, a vibraphone player um, to come and talk to a bluegrass group here and um, for our virtual workshop. So I actually met Chris two years ago on a memoir writing retreat uh, that was being held in upstate New York at a retreat center there. And my former background being in percussion, specifically mallet percussion, I was over the moon to see someone presenting on a mallet instrument uh, that week. So got to experience as you will today, Chris's uh, lovely performance and also in that learn about this um, journey he take he took with music with his dad and um, and she will also get to hear about today 
And so then a few months later, when I was helping to create this new elective for medical students around death and dying using the arts, um, it was just a no brainer to have Chris come and talk to us and to be so the past two years, he's come and presented to medical students and really gotten to learn about this unique journey he's taken. And so thinking about all the loss that we've had for the bluegrass community um, and wanting to hold space for that, it seemed like a no brainer to bring him in to talk to us today. So just wanted to thank you, Chris, for being here and joining us. And with that, I guess we can start off with just telling us a little bit about how did you end up on this journey? How did you end up from doing all the things that Lee told us about playing with all these jazz greats to um, playing music um, at retreat centers and talking to medical students about death and making this album with and for your dad? Thank you so much, Michelle. And yes. Um... It's uh, <laughs> not, maybe not where I thought I'd end up in my life uh, doing all this work, but it's so rewarding and wouldn't have it any other way. So yeah, a little, just a little background. I grew up in San Jose, California and grew up playing, I loved music from an early age, grew up playing piano and drums and Got into jazz in high school, um, but vibraphone was not on my radar at first, aside from just having heard it. It wasn't like a something that was modeled that you could just do. But when I went to college, uh, there was a professor of vibraphone, jazz vibraphone there. I went to college at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. <clears throat> and Wesleyan's a place where there's a lot of kinds of music, and I was exposed to a lot of different ways of creating and uh, uh, interestingly I wasn't totally sure if I was going to pursue the music path in my life and I was into drums vibes not really sure about much and then one summer when I went on a study abroad program to India um, I got a call from my parents while after, like a week after I got there saying that a, a close friend had passed away. And so it was loss that kind of woke me up to what I really felt like I needed to do. And uh, my friend who had passed, who wasn't a musician, he was very creative though. And I knew that he always pursued what he wanted. And I wanted to like honor that in my life by doing the same. And I knew that I wanted to play music. And at that time, that's when I realized I actually want to play vibraphone. <laughs> um, very far from a vibraphone at the time, <laughs> uh, but came back and and applied myself very hard to learning jazz vibraphone. <clears throat> and after a few years, auditioned for the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, and. Uh, got in and that was where I met Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and Terrence Blanchard and uh, studied with all of them and got to perform with them around the world and um, quite a life-changing experience. Also during that time, I it was a stressful time also. <laughs> being I can 25. imagine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, really being grilled hard because the standard is just people come in the, in that program and just expect you to play on the highest level. And here I am, I've only played vibraphone for five years. So I was cramming <clears throat> and halfway through that program, I, I, I had meditation had been something I was looking for, but I hadn't found quite the practice that would work for me. And then I went and did a Vipassana meditation 10 day retreat. And that was very life changing as well. Um, and when I came back to my life after that, things had changed a bit. And I found that music, there was an impact it had on my music, on creating music. And I felt like there was this opening of making, especially in composing, I was noticing it. Um, so that was something that came up at that time. Um, 
when I went on to, I moved back to New York after that program and, you know, as one does, you know, tried to be a jazz musician <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure an easy thing to do here in the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, it's, it was, and still is a hub for jazz and, but it's a hard city, you know, it's, I think it's a hard thing to do anywhere. Uh, New York's an expensive and busy place. And there's also, you know, also it's a very high standard of, there's you know, thousands of people trying to play jazz in New York and only a handful who are successfully really doing it full time. So as I was trying to do that, I managed to cobble together the funds to create an album and had my compositions and I was all excited. I released it. And, you know, I, during all this time, I felt like my mission with music was to reach people, touch people, move people in some way. But it, kind of the specifics of that were a little vague. I just knew that that's what I needed to do with music. And I released the album. And a lot of the like business parts about that were, there was a lot of disillusionment that happened after that experience. I guess I, it was interesting, the more attention that it got, it, like it got a lot of press attention. It was reviewed in the New York Times. I was profiled in the New York Times. I got on NPR, all this stuff. And the more that that would happen, weirdly, like the more wrong it felt. <laughs> I don't know how to describe So it's like you were doing all the things that people say would typically make you successful, but yet it didn't feel. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like that perception of success versus like what the actual experience was. There was a real disconnect. Yeah. And, you know, it took a while to work through that and feel like I still wanted to make music because ultimately my goals starting out weren't, you know, my the why of why I played music didn't have to do with like financial success. If I wanted financial success, I probably would have gone into a different field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would have been smart of me. Um, but of course, I want to be able to survive. You know, I, I think I did expect or hope to be able to make a living and be able to do what I want to do, which is very challenging. Mm -hmm. And so that those expectations had to get mitigated. And, you know, the whole understanding of what success in jazz meant had, had to get you know i had to really work my head around that and you know after i kept meditating and you know um self-care and i i do a lot of teaching still do always has have as an adult working with kids kind of like tapping into what that true inspiration of music is for me and why i do it mm -hmm. i you know kept writing, I found a way to, okay, I'm going to get back on this and keep writing. So there were times where I think the, the disillusionment kind of got in the way of making music. And um, that's when I started writing for like, okay, let me focus in, let me try to do it with a smaller group. Um, maybe I can do more solo. I started interviewing people about solo music. You know, how do you make solo music is something I was a bit afraid to do at first for a while and then I did have a practice of like in my practice sessions opening up by recording solo music and just you know play record it play like it's a piece of music but it's totally improvised and that was kind of like starting to be like my meditation session of music <laughs> that makes any sense Sure. And is that where you were at when everything happened with your dad? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so around 2017, 18, it was around that time. And uh, uh, interestingly, my mom had been in the hospital and I uh, had recorded some music for her because she didn't want any visitors. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, show her some care. So I, I recorded some, some of these improvised tracks and I tried to like, 
just infuse them with love and send it to her. And it was really effective. She said it was really like soothing. And we had these tracks. And then six months later, my dad was in the hospital and in the ICU. And it, you know, uh, long story short, we we didn't realize like that he was at the end of his life, but it became clear at that time that his time was coming to an end and he was running out of, you know, healthy days or even hours, it seemed. And we were there in the hospital with him in the ICU and he had to have a pump put into his heart. It was dire, you know, we were told that he, you know, could die at any time. And we were playing in this, these three tracks that I had from my mom, from playing them for my mom and we were playing them for him. And we were playing other music for him. He loved opera and jazz and all kinds of things. Uh, but the tracks that I played seemed to be a bit more effective. They seemed to be calming him more. And um, fortunately, it turned out that he was discharged, or not discharged, but <laughs> he was, he did not die in the hospital. He kind of bounced back a little bit. He was sent to hospice care. So we went to a hospice inpatient unit and then he was discharged from there because he wasn't immediately dying, it turned out. Um, but, um, so he was sent to home hospice care. And that's where I had the chance to play for him um, and bring my vibraphone and, and play it at my parents' place in Pennsylvania and um, where they had moved. Uh, yeah. and uh got to record and i would i played and recorded for him every, you know every night that i was there he had a lot of trouble sleeping uh, a lot of pain a lot of um like anxiety really severe anxiety uh, and the feelings around and you know he wasn't a lot of coming to terms with the end of his life, which, um, you know, he wasn't really thinking before he had been in the hospital that he was about to die. So there was a lot to come to terms with about that. Yeah, it sounds like it. And you had mentioned when he was in the hospital, he was listening to kind of his um, favorite genres of music, but it sounds like he was resonating more with your music. Yeah, and at, similarly at home, um, we tried playing him some opera. <laughs> uh, you know, we played. He loved Stan Getz and like um, like bossa nova music and um, jazz. And sometimes we played him that stuff, and it it would be the right time. Um, the opera didn't seem to ever be the right time <laughs> in that setting, and it was interesting. Just like it made me think about the intention of the music and what I was doing was so intentional for that exact time and place. And I think that's part of what made it the most helpful at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a, a good six weeks together or so, maybe longer um, while he was at home. And there was a that was a whole roller coaster of an experience. I know I've come to your classes and talked for like hours about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but just to skip over a little bit um, and talk about yeah, some, what was that process like in those six weeks of making music with them? Yeah. Um, it started off with playing what I was familiar with, which was playing pretty short pieces mm -hmm. and like 10 minutes. And again, I wanted to convey love to him. I also wanted to convey, I knew he was going through this very difficult time, of course. And I knew that he was, his life was ending. And I, I wanted to convey the feeling of meditating to him he wasn't a meditator he was a very spiritual guy in his own way and 
even asked me at one point, like, can you show me how to meditate? Uh, and it was a little challenging to find the time and place to do that. But with the music, I just would enter like more of a meditative space and play from there. And over time, what that did was kind of elongate the tracks also out of need for the tracks to be long so that um, to give my mom a break a little bit and so they help you know help keep him in that space for longer um but the tracks became longer and longer instead of 10 minutes 20 minutes 30 minutes and then eventually 40 so all this was recorded and i put the music onto cds for him and he had a cd player next to his bedside and he would just anytime he would wake up in a panic or feel a lot of pain or anything or just need some reflection time he put the cds on for himself when i wasn't there playing already he would use that after about a month of that he we started talking about it and uh at one point <laughs> um you know, I, I walked into the room after you know in the morning and I heard the last track of of the last CD playing and ending and he was like he was like good stuff <laughs> and, uh, and he was like that was I just listened to all five hours in a row <laughs> wow like, so you had five hours of music you had created during this process yeah at that point it became five hours and and we started talking about the music and he was voicing the desire to share it with others and um he was a marketing guy so he was coming up with like a marketing <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted to uh you know he wanted to share it and make an album and so then i started you know talking with him more about it can we name the tracks so we named we listened to the tracks together and and created names. These were all just improvised pieces, but um, we talked about what was coming up for him during it, and, or he would just, we would listen and he would just say what it was that he thought it should be called and I would ask him why. And, you know, some of the tracks were things like um, Sky, he and asked him why he said, well, it reminds me of a game I used to play as a child. I would look up at the sky and see the clouds and, um, mm -hmm. you know, try to make, make shapes or kind of create what they're, make a story out of it. And other things he would say, he called a, a track, um, Mindful Recognition. Mm -hmm. We changed that one eventually, but as it made it was really interesting because it became clear he was like doing a whole life review during these um, while he's listening. And it, before that, it was more seemed like just it was calming for him, but actually there was all this reflection happening, and um, yeah, uh, we. We kept the music playing all the way up through his, the end of his life. And um, in the last three days, he was not conscious, but we just kept it playing on the CDs. And uh, he passed away with the, with the music playing. And, um, yeah. It's really beautiful. I just love that you had this space that you created through the music for your dad to, and you to both, I think, to connect, but also it seems like the music really became like this vehicle for him. Like it was not only um, something to relax by, but it was really giving him a space in a container to kind of do this end of life reflection. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was meaningful for him and me and my family. Um, and so the music, uh, after he passed, um, I, of course, uh, I took a little break right, from playing sure. it. Um, but one of the things that kind of kept me in music 
at that time was knowing that my dad really wanted the music to be shared and his dream of creating the album. We had even created album art while he was <laughs> alive. <laughs> so we had the album cover all ready to go. And there was like, he was already trying to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> and did you so, guys have a title at this point? Yeah, we came up with peace. Just peace. We there was we got there through a little bit of a process. And so the peace album was something I was in the first year after you died working on. Um, and I, I was using it as an opportunity to learn how to mix my own music uh, because it was five hours of music and I didn't have the budget to pay someone to do that. And it just seemed so personal. So uh, that was also like, for me, a chance of chance to like, it was a processing place for me. It became that as I was producing the music and mixing it. And I took, I took a full year to do that. And at the end of that year, I had this, I, I had started doing some outreach to the medical world because that was our first, you know, when we we're there with my dad in the hospice center, his first thought was like, well, what about everyone else here? And there were a lot of people there without visitors. And yeah, the hospitals can be lonely places at times. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to find a way to bring the music to the hospice. And so I started doing some outreach and it just sort of like every time I would contact someone, it would sort of like lead to like five different places instead of just hospice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you had asked about like, how did I come to start doing all this other work? That's kind of, that was the beginning of it for me was that type of outreach. Yeah. I, yeah. And so thanks for sharing all that. And so you've just gone through like this intense journey, musical journey really with your dad and also I'm sure emotional and it sounds like even spiritual journey. Um, did that or how did that change your relationship with music? It sounds like it was already starting to shift before your dad's experience, but I'm just curious as to what that, did it continue to shift or what effect it had on you? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think it, I think the change was instant in that experience. And it was like a period, a process of catching up to what happened. It was such a pivotal, I mean, of course, anyone who's been through a major loss, you know, how, how life-changing that is in and of itself. And then to have this experience playing for him. And I actually think just, yeah, for me, spiritually, there was a, a, a big change in doing the process of playing and trying to convey the meditation to him. There was something that happened where my meditation practice and my music practice like converged mm -hmm. and um, it was never the same after that. I can and imagine. It sounds like a really transformative experience. Yeah. And you had mentioned earlier, um, you were earlier in your career as a musician, you were doing kind of all the right things we talk about in music, like you had like played with all the great people, you were getting recognition from all the places, but it just didn't feel right. Did this experience kind of give you clarity or insight regarding that kind of discord that was happening? At first it gave me inner conflict. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I, I think it because I couldn't it was hard to I had one view of what my career was what music was for me and then this was presenting a very different thing there were th times prior to this experience where I thought it was in the back of my mind I wanted to play for people who had who were dying and it was I I had been looking into it and I couldn't really wrap my head around it at the time but even had people had contacted me and said, this music really helped. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, my jazz music compositions <laughs> uh, that like helped someone who was in near the end of their life. 
and it, that was very meaningful for me. So this was something I was interested in, but it was, having the experience then like opened up all these questions for me about like, well, where am I going? Am I going to go do a music therapy degree? Am I going to quit and become a social worker? What am I doing? <laughs> you know, and uh, um, over time, it became a little more clear and through the experience of playing trying to play this way in like a concert setting I think that was and I didn't really have a chance to do that very much I I did it like once or twice and then the pandemic hit and the pandemic yeah. <laughs> had its, its own effect yeah, uh, it's quite a, a life-changing experience for all of us yeah yeah and um obviously I was I had to play solo at that point there was no option to play with others for a quite a, quite some time, mm -hmm. and so then I um, actually recorded a ton of music during that and created a series that people subscribe to, and then they they voted on their favorite pieces. There were like eighty of them, and then those we created the albums Journeys Volume One and Two of that, and then also during that time I got into playing Mbira music from Zimbabwe oh. and that was very impactful for me too. So it sounds like it just really started taking you off in these different unexpected directions. Um, what do you think are some of the maybe key takeaways or surprises or lessons you kind of learned along the way in navigating this loss or this journey with grief and loss, uh, especially related to your music? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's grief. I didn't know what to expect. I think I, I had been through, you know, losing my good friend and that had a huge impact on me. Um, but this was very different. And I think some of the challenges of grief for me have been like the ways that grief comes out in a way that you can't recognize what it is. Um, like, for instance, physical pain or actual like physical debilitation, which at one point I like had a hard time walking, you know, shortly after my dad died. Um, uh, really like being hard on myself in ways that seemed totally unrelated. Um, definitely coming back to like feeling guilty. And I didn't realize why I would feel guilty. And um, I do remember feeling a lot of fear, almost like I heard a sound in the night and I was like afraid. And so some of these were a little more obvious to trace back, but it was like all these, it wasn't like always direct and um, even sometimes like anger or resentment about things that have seemed to have nothing to do with my dad. But it turns out, you know, I could like trace it back to that after a while working with a therapist. Um, but one of the things that always seemed to help me um, was music and listening to to music. Um, there's a couple songs still that, for whatever reason, um, every time I hear them, it's just like tears. <laughs> and uh, whatever whatever it was, that's like what tapped into it for me. And, I still can't even fully explain it, I feel like, but um, that's the mis mystery of music is like, we find like that mirror of ourselves in what someone else has created. And, and then also creating, creating my own music. And uh, one thing that happened after a year of making, you know, while I was uh, finalizing the piece album, I had to listen through the whole thing and at that point, I'd listened to it so many times. Um, I felt like I needed something to do. So I started writing. Mm -hmm. And what came out of it over the course of a whole night was just, it blew my mind. Like all these things that came out, all this writing, there were, you know, poems, reflections, cries, prayers, like all these things that were came out of it. And I ended up writing a bunch of songs using those words, um, which I hadn't done before, but I found it really healing. 
It's really beautiful. You reminded me of, I took a class on trauma and resilience years ago, and they were talking about the arts being this kind of buffer zone or safe space sometimes to process trauma and suffering. Like it might just be too overwhelming to actually state it or to think about it. But this medium of having art, whether it's writing or music, kind of gives us a safe place to play with our feelings and emotions. And like you were saying, sometimes um, grief comes out in really unexpected ways, like pain and anger and and other feelings like that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I like that way of thinking of it as like sometimes you have to come at it sideways because like the direct thing. It's like we're protecting ourselves from feeling that, um, mm -hmm. but we'd also need it. We need to feel it for it to come out in a way that's not harmful for ourselves or others. For and, sure. Yeah. So having that outlet, whatever it is, and I know it's different for everyone. Yeah. So. And I think sometimes to our society, we have this, I've heard this a lot of my patients working in spiritual care that it's almost we have to give ourselves permission to grieve because sometimes there's this idea that, oh, if I'm sad or grieving, I'm somehow less of a person. I have to always be positive, but I've lately been thinking about it. Like we have all these notes on our scales and maybe we don't, especially in like bluegrass, maybe use all the A flat or the F sharp all the time um, or the B flat. But if we don't ever use those notes, our music is going to be less interesting. If we're always just playing the same three or four notes, we now have access to all 12. Um, it's never going to be quite as interesting and our feelings and our emotions are kind of like that too. It's like, do we always need to be sad and grieving? Um, that probably wouldn't be healthy, but we have those emotions and feelings there for a reason and purpose. And um, mm. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And, um, yeah, I, I found it hard to like let go of like, for a while, I felt like I needed to be sad. And when I wasn't, I, I was giving myself a hard time about it. And uh, that was creating some, some difficulty for me. So just, yeah, I like that idea of like, thinking of one's lived experiences of the chromatic scale. <laughs> You're not going to want to play all of it. <laughs> all the time. All the time, but you probably want to change keys sometimes. And yeah. Yeah. And maybe not throw in a bunch of tritones, but maybe it's nice to have it in there every now and then. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Would you have any, um, for other people who might be going through similar experiences, is, are there any thoughts or suggestions you might have for them? Yeah, I was in. Or inner uh, wisdom. <laughs> with their music. Sure. Um, yeah, and it's, it occurs to me that like with bluegrass, this would probably play out in a very different way. Um, and even for jazz players, it would play out in a different way, depending what instrument you play and what other music you like. Uh, because for me, it's what I currently do, I feel like is more of a fusion. Um, fusion of my jazz background with my studies of Mbira music and other music I love, singer-songwriter music. You know, I'm, I drive around and scream 90s indie rock. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, electronic music, like ambient music, um, all kinds of things. So um, a lot of different world music. So it's all, it all comes in and informs what I do. So I could imagine everyone's got that to some extent. And, um, you know, when we focus on these traditional art forms, we're very focused on learning that tradition and being part of it, which is really important. Um, and then in addition, I'd say it's always possible to like access anything at any time that you and what's going to be true for you at, at any given moment um, might be informed by 
a whole variety of different um, music knowledge that you have and including what you've heard. Mm -hmm. And so, so one piece is just, I, you know, I always encourage everyone <laughs> to just allow it to come through, you know, it's, um, it's your truth. And so what that truth is for you musically doesn't have to be constrained by tradition or training or anything. And uh, I think the more that we open ourselves to that, the more we create something that others, it stirs up something in others that is true for them too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's a great point. It just sounds like kind of using all the resources and just kind of letting what, what comes out come out. And I know a lot of times, or in some, the literature too, they say that grief is like this five-step process, but I know yourself and myself and other people have often found that it's not a easily delineated process. It can be a mixture of different things that don't always yeah. show up in a accurate or a logical linear timeline. Yeah, and no one would be able to predict what it would be, not even. Sure. Yeah, totally. So I think, yeah, musically, what that is for everyone is going to be different. Um, I, just on the practical level, um, you know, what I found to be very helpful when it's come to reaching out and trying to reach other people in that outreach process I was starting to talk about is finding partnerships like you, like with you. <laughs> and others um, because no one can do this alone and um, especially when it comes to using music to help you know help in any other circumstance you know we as musicians aren't social workers or experts in some other field or meditation leaders or yoga instructors or i don't know group facilitators sometimes we are but i found it to be very helpful to work with others and I, um and others have helped what i'm doing and i help what they're doing and it it feels like something that where music can enter places where it might not have entered uh we're often in our world our bubble of you know festivals or clubs or wherever music happens um and it's very meaningful there too but um there's some i always love playing house concerts mm -hmm. because it feels like whatever barriers that are there like social expectations or whatever that happen in those music spaces get dropped oftentimes in house concert settings and it's like a different it's just like you're there hanging out with people and sharing music and it has this different impact mm -hmm. And I think that impact can happen in other places too. Um, lately, I've been playing in settings where everyone's lying down and it's like a, essentially a sound bath, but what I do is really not a sound bath. And if you've been to a sound bath, it's like people hitting gongs and bowls. singing bowls and yeah, it's more like droney. And what I do is really not that it's music and, but um, but people, that sort of idea of, you know, people that are familiar with like the experience of just lying there <laughs> and it's different than a concert. It's, it's more like an inner kind of journey that they're going through. Um, it's just an example of like what I'm doing, but I think I could see other people doing things that I couldn't even imagine, but that are of similar, like analogous, um, you know, in whatever setting that it might exist or, you know, like a writing group or. Well, that's how we met. I was participating in a memoir workshop, which it's memoir, but there's also a lot of loss and things that come up, very personal stories that come up in those types of writing. We, I think, had about 12 people in that group. Hmm. But, but yeah, it was also kind of, it's a each of us have been doing our own writing individually, but there was something about being in that group and having that space for to be seen and heard by others. It was really, um, I guess, pun intended, memorable. <laughs> but, 
Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I came in and was playing at Omega Institute. That was its own interesting thing. <laughs> Good. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with us um, before it might be a nice segue into actually giving us a little bit of an experience as to what it's like to to hear your music or participate in it? Yeah, I think, yeah, it does seem like a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll be, and I'll be interested to hear questions and we can talk about, you know, what's specific to those who are, who are here. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna play a little bit for you all. And um, I actually run a series on Zoom. So I've done this a bit. So I run a series called Transformations. And for that, I usually play for about 45 minutes, but today I'll keep it shorter. It'll be, in the, I guess, about 15 or 20. And what I was thinking, given the topic of what we're talking about and what's coming up, I'd like to invite everyone if you have a piece of paper or some way of jotting something down, just to think about um, a person or as we were talking about earlier, a situation or something that you're grieving. Um, and think of that person or, or situation and just Write down something about that. It could be anything, a thought, a feeling, a memory, even just a word. And just bring that to mind, write it down. And when I'm playing, you're invited to continue to write or you can find a comfortable position and close your eyes and just let your mind be carried by the music. If you want, you could intentionally think about um, anything, but oftentimes I think it's helpful to just let it go and let the music carry. And you might find yourself in like thinking about weird things or in like a dreamlike state or anything like that, or not even listening. And that's more than welcome. Um, it's not a concert, so you don't have to be like focused on what I'm doing. Okay. Um, and if, as you're writing down this thought, um, I don't know if it's gonna overwhelm our, our chat monitor, but I'd like to invite people to share in the chat if you wish. Um, I always like to hear something and that kind of inspires me. But if not, it's okay too. Uh, either way, we'll, we'll work with with this. And, uh, yeah, I'll play for about fifteen minutes, and then then we'll uh, move into Q and A mode. Does that sound right? Sounds good. Well, Chris is gonna go set up here now. I think um, to play for us. But just also wanted to thank each of you again who's on the call or who may be listening later, who's recorded just for joining us for this time and to hold space for whatever uh, you may, or whomever you might have lost or experienced a loss in the past uh, few years, especially during this time of the pandemic. And those losses can be people, they can also be our pets, relationships, jobs, identities, even places that we have held and have lived for a while but yeah the, all those losses and feelings and emotions and hopes and dreams um, they go with them they're all valid and welcome during this time and we don't have to mention that Bill Monroe might be turning over his grave right now and saying that ain't no part of nothing that there is a vibraphone on a bluegrass virtual workshop call right now <laughs> but we'll just offer him and all the others some grace right now who knows next time maybe we'll have a, a banjo moment like this all right 
right, I'll just do a quick little sound check here.
Thank you, Chris, for that lovely music. I'll just invite everyone to come back from wherever they are, whatever position they were just in, wherever that music took them. And as you're slowly coming back to this virtual Zoom space, uh, we'll just open it up for some questions or comments. It's Michelle. Michelle, we do have a question um, from Lori. She says, thank you for sharing your journey. Have you been able to use your music to lift your emotions in a positive way since the loss of your dad? Thank you for that question. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, especially during the pandemic, but I, I think this whole time, except except for maybe the first <clears throat> the first few months after he passed, I had a really hard time playing. But following that, I actually did like a monthly vigil, um, marking them after every month that had been since he had passed. I played for an hour um, just for myself, lit a candle and would play and uh, then started recording. And But through this whole thing, um, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, I don't typically feel in my normal life like a terribly optimistic person. <laughs> But when I'm playing and in the course of playing, um, there's like a feeling of hopefulness that comes through and the feeling of like, um, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. Um, and I, I think that's what, there's like a reassurance in some way that happens through the playing process for me that, uh, um, is very healing for me. Um, uh, that's part of what I, why I want to keep doing it. <laughs> and I don't really know where that comes from. Yeah. It's an interesting part of it. It's not like something I'm like feeling beforehand and like, okay, I got to do this. It's like I open myself to it and then it comes through while I'm playing. And thank you for sharing that the word was grace that you wrote. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I think when I've heard you play, Chris, it definitely takes me to this place. Um, likewise, it's kind of hard to describe, but maybe like lightness or joy or. Yeah, there's something uplifting about it. Yeah. Uplifting. <laughs> oh, it looks like we have another question in the chat. Uh, do you find intentional playing as important as the music you play? Thinking about the person you are playing for and the person and the purpose. Hmm. Yes. Very much so. I. It's interesting. Um, so in settings where I'm playing for other people, it's very obvious who they are. What, and that's part of what the invitation. You know, in my Zoom series, I always invite people to share something because it gives me something to respond to, or at least you know, to start off. And then the music kind of takes over from there. But <clears throat> I do, I think about who I'm playing for and, um, you know, even if I can't see their faces, I think about, I just look at who it is and I'm thinking about who they are in some way I'm playing for them. And that does change what the music is. And when I'm recording, it's interesting because I don't know who is going to hear it. But I have found that it's like um, 
I do, I actually see people in my mind while I'm playing um, oftentimes. And I often don't know who those people are. And when I'm recording, that happens a fair amount. And so I, um, usually there's not a direct intention with that aside from let come, let whatever comes through, come through and follow it and try to execute it the best I can. Um, so I'm, it's a process of like listening, inner listening um, and just following. Try to let the music play itself and there's something to do with like who it's going to i know that but uh, in the recording process it's a little more a little more mysterious gotcha. so it's very interesting and i know catherine mentioned that she felt a strong sense of forgiveness come through for her when you were playing mm. Love that. thank you thank you catherine for sharing that And Annie Beach mentions that um, made her reflect and make some notes about her big sister who died recently at 95. Mm. What a blessed life. Thanks, Annie, for sharing that. Thank you. Are there other questions people are holding on to? Well, while people are thinking about that, I'll just throw out that I have a very strong connection to, but for me, there's a very strong connection with grief and music, but, but different types of music than we heard today. But I, listening to it and reflecting on it was, um, reminded of why those other types of music are what I cling to and what um, what resonate with me in times of grief. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think everyone has their own version of that. Like I was saying earlier, for me, it's these like late 90s indie rock <laughs> yeah you're reminding me of i like to curate playlists i probably should have been a dj in a former life but definitely have some playlists that kind of allow me to sink into that space of grief and loss when i need to and they're very specific songs Yeah, it's made me want to write songs like that, but I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I wrote my own version of it. I do have some songs. Yeah. Yeah. I've somehow ended up writing lots of songs about grief and death, but I don't know where they come from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're very moving to me. Well, thanks. Any further thoughts that folks want to share in the in the chat? Anything questions that's coming up? Anything? Yeah, anything. questions really about anything. anything. <laughs> Even what's your favorite like grief song? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're reminding me of that um, when I was in med school I was having some going back to your comments about like you were having weird physical symptoms or things coming up for you and you didn't know where they were coming from and I had a similar experience when I was in medical school and went to see my doctor and we were looking into like maybe some side effects from some things and but he was also like maybe you should go talk to someone because of all the things you're going through and so I did and the therapist almost immediate was like yeah, you have unprocessed grief from these things and you have to go process them. And I was like, well, how do I do that? I don't know how to just like go grieve on demand. <laughs> He's like, just whatever helps you. And I remember there was um, also had a loss in when I was in high school of a close friend through an accident. And there was um, a Stephen Curtis Chapman song that had just come out, I think called With Hope that had somehow really moved me to tears at that time, I think because of the connection. And so I still had that CD and like I went and put it on and listened to that song like 20 times in a row until the tears started coming. And it was probably
probably the best thing I could have done at the time. Mm. But yeah. 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 Interesting that it took so many listens, but then it worked. Yeah, I don't remember how, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but there was something like that was the way I was able to access and tap in. Mm. It's amazing how music can hold that space. Uh, we have another question. Um, do you play at nursing homes uh, from Randy? He says, I witnessed miracles with music at facilities before. Yeah, thanks, Randy, for that. And I feel like this is an untapped area for me. I have done it a little bit, but very little. And I would love to do it more. Um, I've heard of really amazing things too. Um, and I know with um, music therapy, there's a lot of studies about how uh, music that's memorable for people from their earlier years uh, can help, for instance, with Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, really greatly help. And um, I know that's not my calling quite to play that music, <laughs> but um, although I do know some jazz tunes that probably people would know, but um, but I would like to try it and um, and see what happens. I really haven't done it in quite a long time, so it's it's something I, I would like to do. Um, hopefully, we'll be doing um, in the coming year. Um, I'll use that as a chance to talk about my Zoom series called Transformations. Uh, so that's sort of the closest I'm getting right now um, is doing it online. And it's what the beauty of that is that people can access it, people who might be, you know, there are people who join who are housebound or, you know, unable to attend in-person events for various reasons. And other people, you, you don't have to be housebound to join. It's called Transformations. It happens twice a month right now. Um, it's sponsored by a group called Connect.Faith. And it's totally free for attendees and um, have a, a mailing list where we tell people about the, um, or we remind people about the Zooms because everyone needs that because um, we all forget when the Zooms happen. But the the, uh, the events are on the second Monday and fourth Tuesday of each month. And the Monday session is an evening one and the Tuesday one is midday, Eastern time. Um, so I'll see if I can share in the chat, like guess the sign up. Let's see if I can. Actually, I'll just, I'll write an, I'll put an email address in there. Okay. You can email me if you wish to join. Great. Well, thank you again, Chris, for taking this time to talk to us. Uh, do you have any last thoughts or? Oh, where I was going with that partially was um, yeah. the series is expanding and I'm hoping that to be able to reach people in nursing homes and also hospice and other, uh, we're actually hoping to start a a series that's focused on grief, kind of like what I did today. Um, so that's all in the works also. Great. Yeah. Sounds exciting. Exciting in its own way. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, yeah, I always, I guess, being in the chaplain spiritual care world, I say things like exciting about things like death and grief and loss, but maybe that's not quite the right word. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's beautiful to be able to help people in that way. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Sure. sure. Yeah. Do you have any last minute questions or any lingering thoughts from people? Well, Annie sh shared that as her husband was actually dying, some of the young guys from Jam Pack gathered and sang his favorite bluegrass songs, November Rain, White dove shouting on the hills of glory. I was so happy that we were all singing for him. And it reminds me of the song, Who Will Sing for Me? 
Mm. Yeah. It's beautiful. And you're reminding me of an encounter one of my colleagues had, I think early on in the pandemic when um, a gentleman's wife was passing away, I believe right there in the hospital of COVID and he just needed something to kind of ritualize or make the moment meaningful and add closure in this really kind of chaotic, unexpected time. And they at one point in their relationship had separated and it looked like they were going to separate and he wrote a song for her and that song ended up bringing them back together. And so with the help of my colleague, um, they were able to realize that what was needed in that moment was to play the song that he had written for her as she was dying to kind of show his love and connection. And I was not there, but I heard the story secondhand and it sounded like a really meaningful way. So thanks for sharing that memory, Annie. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I always love hearing the different ways people use music at the end of life. It's it's always like it's different for everybody and so suited for who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think dying like grief, I guess like life, it's like it's, each one of us has our own creativity we bring to it. And there are templates and maybe options, but we each kind of bring our own um, flavor influence to the moment. Great. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Chris, um, and for taking this hour and a half to share your music and your story with us. I hope it's been helpful for people. Um, and if anyone has anything that comes up um, later on, I would say definitely feel free to reach out. I know some of you um, are not able to listen in real time and we'll be hearing this later on, but yeah, I'm sure both of us will be open to any questions or things that might come up later on. And thank you um, from the whole Leadership Bluegrass Alumni Committee and the IBMA community. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Michelle, for, sure, for doing this session today. We really appreciate it. And what a what a beautiful way to wrap up our virtual workshop season of this year. Thanks for everyone for attending. And again, this will be recorded and on, on the IBMA YouTube channel and um, look forward to putting together another season of workshops for next year. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye, thank you.